Vielen Dank nochmal an dieser Stelle an Will für das Übersetzen meines Textes und für die Übernahme des Vorlesens. Mein Englisch ist leider nicht so gediegen, dass ich diese Vorlesung auf Englisch halten könnte. Vielen Dank nochmal. Okay. So, it is well known that our West Germanic ancestors were illiterate. Their culture was based on an oral tradition where they passed on legends and heroic tales from generation to generation, whilst either sitting round the fire or conversing over dinner in the royal halls. As we know, three different writing systems emerged from this culture of orality. The North Germanic peoples adopted the characters of a North Italian alphabet and, from these, developed the runic script soon after the 1st century AD. This script, largely used only for purposes of commemorating the dead and for magic, has long survived in Scandinavia and is preserved on runestones from the Viking Age, with which I'm sure we're all familiar. However, it was only infrequently used for profane purposes, and only in exceptional cases did it find its way into the medieval codices, as we shall see. Norse runic and Old Icelandic gave rise to the modern Scandinavian languages, none of which use runes for their writing system. The indigenous technical term for carving rune stone, runes on a stone is the Germanic runor ritan, at least in older times, ritan is associated relatively frequently with this particular object, i.e. runor. This, for example, is the Jersberg runestone in Sweden. Ek erilar runa brito. In the East Germanic area, the Visigoth bishop Wulfula invented his own script for his early translation of the Bible into Gothic. It is preserved in the Codex Argentius, which you can see here, a magnificent manuscript from the empire of Theodoric the Great, the only one of its kind. This writing system died out with the Goths, however. In West Germanic, from which both English and German emerged, the first writing was not on stones, but rather on whitened animal skin. With the advent of a book-centric new religion, Christianity, the cultural technique of writing in ink on parchment was adopted, so that new beliefs could be recorded and passed on in an immutable manner. This new writing practice saw the adoption of the Latin alphabet and its word for writing, scrivere. The old word ritan, associated with pagan characters, had not yet established itself as a general term for writing, as was the case in English. Here, you can see the commonly understood division and development of the West Germanic languages. To this day, all of them continue to write using the Latin alphabet. In today's lecture, we would like to focus on Old High German. A letter is working on the Alfred Deutsches Wörterbuch and would like to use material from three different word families to show you some of the results of her findings and what this tells us about the high German cultural history of writing. On occasion, we'd also like to show you how this material is presented in the Alfred Deutsches Wörterbuch. So, we'll be focusing on, on three technical terms used for writing in Old High German. We will first look into the two verbs for the writing process itself, Riesan and Skriban. We would like to present the findings and, using a few concise examples, check whether their use contacts overlap and whether it is possible to demonstrate some sort of semantic separation process between the two of them. Thirdly, we will look at the Old High German noun runa, which neither means rune nor ever actually refers to the object of the verb risan in Old High German. The question arises whether the designation of the Germanic characters was inherited in West Germanic, whether it died out on the continent with the runic system, or never existed at all. So, this robe clip with a runic inscription comes from the 6th century, but not from Scandinavia, where inscriptions like these are often found, but from a grave in Germany dating to the Merovingian period. Here too, the technique of carving runes was evidently well known, and was referred to as runa ritan, albeit it is only scarcely attested. Is this bow brooch from Freilalbersheim with the inscription Borsor Rit Runa an indication of the use of runes on the continent as well? As shown by the word rit in the inscription, the second consonant shift has not yet taken place. In other words, it cannot be Old High German. The inscription is therefore considered to be pre-Old High German, and this raises some questions. Can we trace the word runa a few centuries further forward, to the time of Charlemagne and his heirs? What happened to this word during Christianization? Are there any traces of runa left in Old High German? So, we will start with risa. The semantic field around the strong verb risan consists of five verbs. We have the core word and its associated prefix forms, derivations, and nouns. Since we always work with word families at the Althochdeutsches Wörterbuch, we will not just show you the strong verb risan, the core word of the group, but also the near-synonymous prefix forms and derivations that form the research. 
The strong verb resan is attested 24 times. So for our purposes, this number refers to editions of different texts, for each of which there may also be several manuscript versions which lay behind those editions. Of, course, of these, only four instances are not related to the act of writing. They mean to tear something. So in other words, in over 80% of instances, the verb has something to do with carving characters. On the other hand, the weak verb ritzen only describes writing about 20% of the time. Ritzen is more commonly used to mean to scratch or to injure the skin. In addition, three other derived verbs and some nouns belong to the risan family, but they are less frequent. Evidence denoting the carving of characters, and sometimes also drawings, can be grouped in Old High German as follows. Often the verb means carving letters or drawings into a wax tablet with a stylus. Firstly, we will show you an example from Nootka's translation of Boethius's Consolatio Philosophiae, which dates to the beginning of the 11th century. Nootka is one of the most important authors of the Old High German period. He was a headmaster in St. Gallen, one of the most important monasteries in the context of Old High German, and was a great master of languages. He translated several ancient and Christian texts, to which we owe a large part of our surviving Old High German vocabulary. This example compares images being imprinted on our minds, like letters on a wax tablet. Wir werden sie, the images, anagetan unseren Murten, also dero geplane ton tabellon burstaba gerizot werdend mit griffili, mit griffile. The citations from the Althochdeutsches Wörterbuch consist of one, the Old High German sentence, two, the Latin templates, if there's one available, and three, the textual siglum, which can be found in the list of abbreviations. And here the abbreviation is NB, the Nautka Boethius, uh, with page and line numbers according to the edition by Piper, and in brackets, the second edition by King and Tax. A piece of gloss evidence, so this is a single marginal or interlinear Old High German word in an otherwise Latin text, is based on the same source as the text from Boethius. Uh, Latin figere was glossed by Ritzorn. In the Althochdeutsches Wörterbuch, glosses are presented somewhat differently than textual monuments. The Latin text sits in regular brackets, and the Old High German gloss goes at the front in square brackets. The Latin antecedent of the gloss is omitted. The abbreviation of the source text sits after the brackets, and the siglum here refers to the five-volume edition of the Old High German glosses by Steinmeier and Sievers, in this instance, volume two. The second example from Lucas Boethius' translation is part of an old High German digression on philosophy and Cicero, for which there is no original Latin text. Here, it is not characters that are scratched into the wax, but a drawing. Bedio kit descriptio gemale, unde zeichenunge, unde bilde. Also das ist, ube ich mit minemo griffile an enomo wachse, geriso formam animalis. Again, you can read the translation for this below up on the screen. Furthermore, the wax tablet and styluses here are mentioned with the strong verb risan. <laughs> Other material is also suitable for referring to the act of writing characters. In Virgil's Bucolica, there are two glosses from the 11th and 12th centuries in which a lover scratches the name of his beloved in the bark of a tree. Here, inkirere is translated by both the strong verb geritsan as well as the weak verb anigeritse, which shows the extent to which uh, the verbs of this family are synonymous. Garizan or Anagiritzen are written above incidenta in the follow case. Certum est teneris meus incidente amoris arboribus. A second very old gloss dating from the 9th century sits above the Latin describere in the Bible and describes the marking of the layout of Jerusalem on a brick. And once again, Gerises stands, stand above descri Describes. Et tu, fili hominis, sumiti bilaterem, et ponis eum coram te, et Describes in eo civitatem Jerusalem. In another piece of evidence from Nootka's adaption of Martianus Capella's De Nuptius Philologiae et Mercurii, so that's on the marriage of Philologia and Mercury, it is not clear on what sort of material characters are actually being marked. This passage is about the magic ointment that Philologia prepares, so as not to be burned up on the ascent to heaven. She scratched his magic, old magic formula from Colchis on some sort of material using a hard point, perhaps on woods, bark, stone, or wax. 
Der Kolchis Krogermenot ward auch von der Iro Philologia gezeichnet. Rezondo mit Adamantina Rofasson. The third semantic field of Risan describes writing or drawing with a finger on the earth. Two examples of this usage survive in Otfried's Evangelion Buch from the 9th century, which can be traced to John 8.6 in the Bible in this instance. And just by the way, Otfried is the first German author we happen to know by name. Um, in the 9th century, he wrote a synopsis on the life of Jesus in the vernacular. And this is one of the three great Bible transmissions that survived us from the Old High German period. Selbo druchti nida sach, so man si imo diskis brach, in erdo do, so man weiß, mit demo fingere reis. And the second, er sach, er sich sah nida neigter, so sliomo er diski meinta, mit demo fingere avo reis, joch jagilich sa usmeis. Otfried's language is heavily influenced by rhyme. Both the examples with reis are rhyming elements. Risan here is attested without an object, and therefore it remains unclear what Jesus actually wrote on the ground with his finger. There are 16 glossed examples on this passage in the manuscripts which survive from the 10th to the 12th centuries. Um. Okay. Uh, uh, Risan is uh, written um, by, uh, above Scribebat. Jesus autem in clinan sede orsum digito scribebat in terra. So the glossing of this Bible passage is revealing because both Otfried and the glossators translate the original Latin scribe with risan and not with scriban, quite in contrast to the Latin. An act of writing that involves scratching or indenting the writing surfaces, i.e. writing with a finger on the ground, uh, clearly could not be translated with scriban in the 9th century. It becomes clear from the evidence that risan is reserved for the scratching of only certain materials, mostly wax, wood or stone. There is no evidence from the Old High German period of a time when Riesan was used in a general sense, meaning to write, as we have in English. There is no evidence for the word explicitly being used to describe writing in a book, namely with pen and ink on parchment. This method of writing is clearly denoted by the much more frequent verb scriban in Old High German. We'll now move on to the second area of our discussion, the strong verb scriban, um, which is many times more frequent than Riesan. It is attested 290 times in Old High German, including forms with a prefix, of which ge is the most common. We will, however, not discuss the many derivations of scriban which appear in Old High German. So if the verb occurs without an object, it describes the act of writing, and sometimes acts associated with writing. Up here, you can see the famous Sankt Gallen Schreiberwias, a probatio penae, so that's the testing of a new pen, uh, from the 9th century. Humor gescreb, viel humor kipet. The words express both lamentation and relief at finally finishing writing a tedious and lengthy codex. Um, and sometimes we have direct evidence of what is actually being written. Dieser Archesilaos kos dia tubun wanda er skreb von a fogalen. Or even the language it's being written in. So scribent Gottes degana in Frankis kon di regula. Hmm. These examples make it clear that the content of what is written, or the language used to write it, is not often discussed in the context. Now let's look at some examples of the transitive verb scriba. It can take a number of different objects. Individual characters, lines, letters, words, sentences, and even books. But scriba is also used to refer to abstract concepts. The miracles of Jesus, different events, decisions, prophecies, songs, utterances. In these cases, the writing process itself takes a backseat to reporting and narration. In many cases, the word Buch is mentioned as an object of, or in the same context as, Scriban. It was used in the same context as Scriban following ancient writing practices to designate a writing tablet, which would be made of beech wood, or several wax tablets bound together. In Old High German, Buch already means a parchment codex. So this example here of writing something in a book comes from the Old High German Tation, a gospel harmony based on an original by Tation the Syrian and was translated from Arabic, Greek and Latin into Old High German by an unknown translator in the 9th century. It is one of the earliest major Old High German texts and is a slavish translation of the Latin text written in the left column of the same page, but nevertheless is the first example of a great biblical epic written in Old High German. 
An der Rio Zechan, Täter der Heiland, die nie sind geschrieben in diesem Buch. The second. We also have another example from Lucas Boethius. Beda, der ist, das ist ein Phänomen, aber danach schreib in seinem Buch De Natura Rerum. Hmm. Most of the evidence from Old High German refers to writing within a biblical context. Very often we'll hear the phrase, it is written in the Bible. Or in other words, it's been authenticated and documented in writing, a phenomenon which was extremely important for the new faith. Das gefühlt werde Wort, das in Ero Evo geschrieben ist. And here Eva means law and refers to the holy scriptures. So gewisso ist geschrieben in Genesi, in die Rego Noda, Druchtin, Uber, Sodomam, in die Gomorram, Svebol, in die Fio. So it's not just the book in which something is written that is named in texts. Authors are sometimes named too. For example, ancient authors. Tragödie sind luctuosa carmina, also dios sind die Sophocles Grape apud Grecos. We find members of the church. Wann er, Johannes, geschreibt uns, wie er, Jesus, Hera, in Worold kwam. Or even authors like Otfried, whom we saw earlier. For example, miracles of Jesus are written down and recounted. Nu ist is the book about, about the life of Jesus, mit Sinera, means Christi, Givelti, Pracht, Alan Enti, geschrieben, so sie baten. So these examples should suffice to make it clear that the surviving evidence in Old High German does not explicitly reference the writing technique per se, rather the content, authors, languages, quotations, and so on, and that the context alone gives us implicit information about the act of writing itself. Writing techniques or materials are hardly ever discussed, as all the examples mentioned implicitly involve writing with a pen and ink on parchment. It can be assumed that Buch means a codex, that the Bible also took the form of a parchment codex, and that ancient authors, ecclesiastical authorities, and monks of the ancient times wrote in codices, as we can see from the examples. It can therefore be assumed that writing took place on parchment, based on the ancient and biblical evidence that dominated in the Old High German period. We will now turn our attention to evidence from other lexical items in the Scriban family, uh, which describe a writing material that's a bit different from parchment. Here, as you will see, one would really expect Risan to be used based on what we know. So we'll now look at some overlaps where Scriban is used instead of Risan. Writing with a stylus on a wax tablet, which, as I saw towards the beginning, is often paraphrased with Risan, can also be referred to with Scriban. We'll show you three examples from Nutka's translation work. Firstly, in this one here, the fates have sharpened their pens and smoothed their wax tablets to note down Jupiter's speech. Wanda aber tres parke, jovis brie farun, sine reda filogi varo scribent. So watston si iro griffela, also scribun sullen, unde dero burch camaro flegerun, unde blano ton iro Tabellas, Zeskribene, die Tate und den Rat, der Rohimiliskon. In this next example, Boethius wrote Lamentations using a stylus, although a wax tablet is not explicitly mentioned here. Uns ich, Boethius, sus armerlicher Klagers Gräb mit Timo Griffile, war sah ich ein Wiebstan. And in this next example, Philologia wrote magic songs using some sort of hard pen. Again, a wax, a wax tablet is not explicitly mentioned. Mit ihro härten Griffele schreib sie Philologia zauberlichio carmina. Interestingly, expanding the context reveals another technical term. You already know this from the Risan word family, as we'll see from the same example again, which we've seen before. Um, here, it becomes clear that even in the same context, both verbs are more or less interchangeable and were probably used to create stylistic variation. These examples all come from the end of the Old High German period, each of which was written by Nautke. However, there are two older references by Tatian in which Scriban is not explicitly mentioned, but is referred to in connection with the use of a writing tool. The two terms Scribsachs and Scribatusi are problematic, but one can certainly see that wax tablets and, and styluses are meant to be understood by them. 
Zacharias bat do Skrip Sachses Skreib sus quedanti Johannes ist sie namo. In the second, in fach den Skrip azusi in die Sitzis Liomo in die Skrip Fionfzuk. These are two very early examples of Skriban meaning Risan. This usage is likely imitative of the Latin original. The meaning to chisel something in stone also occurs with Skriban. Laws, for example, are carved in stone and thus preserved for eternity. This example comes from Nautica's Salta. Uh, Nort Nautica, by the way, did not just translate ancient classics. Um, towards the end of his life, almost as the crowning of his life's work, he began to turn his attention towards Bible translation too. Du, Jesus, ne wille sie, the people, skuldig werden an der Olege, dio in tabulis lapides an steinen tabilon geschrieben ward. It was also customary in Roman times to mark in stone tablets whatever you decided to leave to your descendants after your death. Ceromo was sito, dass die vorderen hießen in tabulis all geschrieben, dass sie beneimdon ihro afterkommon. This next example from Nordke's Capella translation deals with books that are worthy of preservation in stone. Die Reiza dero Buro Athanasia gesehen dio, hieß sie sie geschrieben in dioren Steinen und gehalten in den Erdlucheren dero Ägyptes kon Kilechon. Mm. Nordke also translates scratching on metal plates with scriban. So an, oh. an erinen tabellon scriban. And finally, the third known meaning of Risan is also attested with Scriban. So Jesus writes with his finger on the earth, and again the Bible passage John 8, 6 is being translated here. Nihain darinne bileib, uns er da niedere dos greib. And, once again, Risan is in the immediately adjacent context. And you'll already be familiar with this passage from the remarks on Risan. There is further evidence for the use of both verbs in the same context. Oh, this is further evidence for the use of both verbs in the same context. Rather. So, to summarise, from analysing the attestations of both verbs, it becomes clear that there are typical usages for both in Old High German. While Riesan is limited to the carving of signs in wax, wood, stone and earth, the verb Skriban, which is much more frequent, has a broader scope. In 90% of instances, it is, of course, restricted to writing with pen and ink on parchment, but in a few instances, instances it also extends to the same domain as Risan. This means that the loanword Skriban is already used so generally in Old High German that it can also be used for other writing processes, like scratching or carving. There is, however, an important caveat to this overlap. Of the 17 passages, um, we've not shown them all here, where Skriban is used in the context typical of Risan, 14 of them are from Nordka, whose material is often used to demarcate the end point of the Old High German period. We don't find a single example of a gloss that glosses Riesan typical context with Skriban. So, Riesan, which is often seen in glosses, is no, look, no longer productive as a general term, meaning to write, in the Old High German period. So was there perhaps a phase of tolerance between the indigenous and borrowed terms in the Old High German and pre-Old High German periods? The Old Saxon Heliant shows this, as the text sees both verbs used synonymously. In Old High German, the process of semantic divergence had already begun, and it can no longer be proven that they were synonymous. Retan was also used more generally for writing on parchment. The Latin scribere is also borrowed into English, but was restricted to penitential church practice. The fine semantic shade of the special scratching technique remains the sole domain of the Old High German verb risen as is the case that persists into the modern language. In this respect, the Old High German material already shows us the situation that remains typical for the centuries that followed, a term for the designation of a special recording technique. Since the verb gives little, gives little information about the writing process itself, we would now like to look at the object of the scratching process, the word runa, and pursue the question of whether a runa can still be associated with writing during the Old High German period. So the Germanic noun runo has formal descendants across all the Germanic languages. However, the daughter terms are attested with two rather distinct meanings. In Old Norse and Old English, runo can mean something written, like a runic symbol or a letter. Um, and in all the other Germanic languages, its semantic function lies in the oral domain, 
and it can mean whisper, secret, or even advice or decision. There has been a long debate in etymological research as to whether the two meanings can be traced back to a common root. Older hypotheses try to bridge the semantic gap by characterising runic writing as a magically charged secret knowledge. More recent etymologies, on the other hand, propose various Indo-European roots as the starting point for disparate semantic outputs. The etymological debate is not pertinent to our discussion, however, as interesting as it may be, but we would now like to investigate the situation specifically in Old High German. <coughs> so, here is an overview of the usage of the Runa word family in Old High German, including the verb runin and its derivatives. The main scope of the word family runa, runain, has a primary meaning of to whisper, or can refer to a whisper or a whisperer. We'll not go into the individual lexemes of the word family here, and in most evidence, whispering only really describes a modulation of the voice, but is also occasionally associated with a spiteful secondary meaning, as we'll come to see. A few pieces of evidence attest some sort of magically charged murmur, a whisper, or murmured incantation, which is not far removed from the more abstract meaning of magic or sorcery. Since the content of a whisper is often secret, it's easy to see how the secretive meaning actually comes about. Since the meanings of the word family for runa and runin, which are oriented towards orality, are not really relevant here, a very brief overview with just a few concise examples may suffice. The range of magical meanings they have is particularly interesting, but we don't have time to go into all of them today. So one reason for whispering is, as we've said, its use in a magical context. Here you can see three examples of magical whispering for the Susurus Magicus in the middle of the famous deer and doe. Hieritz runeta hinton in das ora. Will du noch hinda? The resulting meaning of a murmured magical incantation can be seen in the example of the gloss heli runa or tord runa, an incantation to kill, translating the Latin necromancia. The word runa or geruni has a Christian influence in the Old Testament and denotes Christian mystery. It dies out after Old High German, however. Here you can see three examples of Giruni, meaning a secret. The last example is particularly interesting, since Old High German here is actually encoded in a runic script. <coughs> so, when thinking about writing, what is particularly interesting is whether there are traces of the Germanic, of the old, in Old High German of the Germanic word runa, meaning a written character before the word disappears with the adoption of Christianity. The phonetic form of the modern German word runa suggests that the chain of transmission must at some point have been broken, because if it had been passed down in the regular usage in the history of the language, we would expect the diphthongized form rauna through the expected unusual sound changes. The related verb raunen still exists in a stylistically elevated register in New High German and is limited to the semantic domain of whispering and murmuring, Runa, in modern German, was therefore not inherited, but, as we know, it reintroduced as a learned relic in its older phonetic form in the 17th century. Unfortunately, in Old High German, there is no simple lexeme runa, which means a written character. In a peripheral era of the Old High German tradition, which is not dealt with in the dictionary, uh, since isolated Old High German words in Latin texts are not the focus of the attention, um, there are five compounds where the second element is runa, which confirms this meaning in Old High German. So there are names for the signs of different coding systems in the so-called Isruna treatise. So this is a small text, a treatise on cryptography, and is written with a very similar structure across five different manuscripts from the 9th to the 11th centuries. In all five manuscripts, the Isruna treatise begins with a series of Old English runes of Futhork, written across several lines. Such runic series are not uncommon in medieval codices. These book runes must be regarded as a scholarly examination of other writing systems, and not as a continuation of old inscribed usage in another medium. The runic series, which is written down in the unique order of the Futhork, and annotated with the name of the respective rune, is followed by another runic series in the order of the Latin alphabet, and annotated with a Latin transliteration. This is then followed by a brief treatise on encryption systems using runes, dots, and noises. So, such secret writing was popular in the Middle Ages and was based on various cryptographic methods, especially substitution using other characters. The function of encrypted runic inscriptions is always the same. 
The food stock is divided into groups of rooms, which are the so-called eights, since they're originally grouped into eight, lots of eight rooms. And the coding of a character happens by specifying two different numbers. Firstly, the number of the room group in which the sign is located. And secondly, its position within that group. In order to represent these two numerical values, scribes use different methods of representation. The Isruna treatise shows five ways of representing these specific numerical values. A Latin text describes how to use the respective substitution sign. The sections are separated by a horizontal line and begin with a runa compound. Firstly, we have is runa. Here the runic character for i is used for encryption. The short i runes refer to the number of the rune group and the long i runes to the position of the character to be encoded within this group. Both the Nordic rune name and the Old High German word can be understood with the, with the element is. Secondly, in the case of Lago Runa, the encryption is carried out using the L rune and the same system as we saw for Is Runa. The name of the L rune, on the other hand, has no equivalent in Old High German, which is why the first member of the compound is a foreign element, Lago. Thirdly, Hahal Runa, in this section, the encryption is done using a runic character. An arrow-like character, similar to the T rune, is attached to the left and right of a main staff. Appended to this is a number of slashes which concord with the number that's to be encoded. Um, this code sign was first associated with the old high German word chachal, meaning a kettle hook. Fourthly, stopfkuna. So here is a type of dot cipher that's being described. A two-row group of dots designates the relevant room group with the number of dots at the top, while the bottom row shows the position of the letter to be encoded in it. And finally, we have Klopfhuna. In this final group, a kind of Morse code is described with the Latin explanatory text. The two numerical values of the letter to be enciphered are denoted by a knocking symbol, a Latin pulsus. The first member of this is the stem of the verb klopfon, which means to knock, and it translates as a knock character. However, it's not entirely clear how two different noises can actually be distinguished when knocking. So these five compounds with the second element, runa, are nominative plural formations based on the strong feminine noun, runa. The first four cases denote characters, and the last example is an acoustic signal. As such, runa belongs to both the medium of writing and acoustics. The root word runa, meaning sign or written character, is made concrete here using various modifiers. Two, or at least one, of the five first compounding elements designate the name of a rune, so the I and the L runes. The last two runa compounds uh, refer to encoding using dots or knocks. The two antecedents, klopf and stopf, are clearly to be classified as Old High German due to the presence of the second consonant shift. Hachal runa can also be identified as Old High German and Is runa possibly as well. So this means that three or four of the five compounds have Old High German determiners. And therefore, the runa compounds documented in the Is runa treatise can certainly be described as Old High German, which is also suggested by the treatise's place of origin in St. Gallen. So, while the compounds of the Is runa treatise have not found their way into the lexicograph lexicographic study of Old High German, another instance of Klopfruna is actually found in all Old High German dictionaries. It's in the back cover binding of Codex Sangalensis 176 on the 9th century and stands next to a satirical poem about a brother named Klimalt who was particularly fond of drinking. The third line from the bottom shows several coding systems. Firstly, each letter is encoded by a Roman numeral, corresponding to the position of the intended letter in the Latin alphabet, and secondly by dots, and thirdly, the heading Klopfruna says that the numerical value can also be knocked. In writing this, the author Eckhart probably elevated himself to quite an immortal status. So, we'll now look at rune star and consider whether this is a message scratched on a wooden stick. The Old High German rune star comes down to us in a very well-known text of the Old High German tradition, the Benedictina Regel, an interlinear gloss text from the 9th century. All Old High German dictionaries misrepresent it, however. Its meaning is difficult to define. Not every word of the Latin text was annotated, but even in the parts that are annotated, the German words do not result in German sentences, as we can see from the example up here. So translating this, the rule states that the monk must never give or accept letters, gifts of friendship, or other small gifts from his parents or anyone else without the express direction of the abbot. 
The three specific gifts listed in the Latin text are litera, eulogia, and minusculum, which are annotated with the Old High German buch, runstab, and manahite. While the glossing of minusculum is unproblematic, it cannot be clarified exactly what the difference is between buch and runstab, and what exactly the latter means. Both nouns seem to denote something written. Perhaps in contrast to the letter marked here with buch, a shorter written message is intended, perhaps a message scratched on a wooden stick. Such tablets or sticks with scratched characters in the function of letters have also been found by archaeologists. So here we see Old Norse runekefli, um, which was found, and this piece was found uh, in the harbour of Bergen in Norway. Um, it is also mentioned by Venantius Fortunatus in the 6th century, who we'll come to again a bit shortly. In the monastic context, message sticks with runic characters are probably unlikely, so perhaps Latin letters are what is intended here. Finally, we would like to point out two examples with runa, which have come down to us as embedded words in Latin treatises. As mentioned, they do not belong to the area that the Althochdeutsches Wörterbuch focuses on. The transmission history of such embedded words is extremely complicated. Their origin and the way they entered manuscripts is difficult to reconstruct which is why it's not easy to linguistically classify them. Scholarly interest in the characters of Norse, or rather in foreign alphabets in general, was huge in England, as well as on the continent. The terms wander, they become distorted, or subsumed as foreign words. And runa also existed as a loan word in Latin dictionaries. So, the treatise De Inventione Literarum that you can see here offers a brief history of various writing systems, formerly attributed to Horobanus Maurus. In it, five different alphabets, including Hebrew and Greek, are presented, each with a short introduction. The treatise also contains a runic alphabet, a typical example of the so-called book runes, which can also be found in the Isruna treatise. The runic alphabet begins with the following text, the English translation of which I'll quickly read out. The images of letters invented by the Northmen are also shown. It is said that so far they are used to record their poetry and incantations. They have given them the name runestabas, Whereas, when written, they reveal, I believe, secret things. Here, the word runestab, and the final th digraph is distorted, um, is not found in the Benedictina Fagel with a meaning, a piece of wood bearing a sign, but instead stands for runic sign. The treatise De Inventione Literarum survives in 18 manuscripts, but the word runestabas is only found in four manuscripts, from the 10th and 11th century, and one from the 15th century. The characters used by the Nordic peoples are not named in the other manuscripts. Perhaps a high German-speaking monk avoid the word runstabas on the basis of English, modelling it on the word buchstab. The Inventione Treatise and runic material is certainly of English origin and was written on the continent, perhaps at Fulda or St Gallen. This document was included by Graf in his Old High German vocabulary and thus characterised as Old High German. Finally, we would like to quote the famous runa reference in the Latin text of Venantius. It comes from the poem Ad Flavum, in which he's urging his friend to write a letter to him. He asks perhaps whether his friend is suffering from some sort of paper shortage and suggests that he's just simply come up with writing anything at all. Um, just to write, just to write anything he can. He just needs to write back, even if it takes to come to writing on bark. Or if for some reason he can no longer speak any Latin, then Hebrew, Persian or even Greek will do. It doesn't matter what to write or how he does it, he should just write. He could even go so far as to paint barbaric runes on an ash board. Um, so here we have the example, uh, the barbaric rune is written on tablets of ashwood. Is runa here a vernacular word embedded in the Latin text, or a vernacular loan word in Latin? If it were German, uh, since Venantius also lived in the kingdom of West Francia for a while, then this would be the earliest and sole piece of evidence of runa, meaning a written character. Wilhelm Grimm even sees this as evidence for written characters being referred to with Runa on the continent. So now, to conclude. It is not possible to say for certain whether all of this was the case or not. The terms for rune carving in Old High German and Gothic were not really applied to the Latin alphabet. However, the eight Old High German compounds shown with the root or determinative word Runa, as well as the simplex evidence we see in Venantius, at least prove the existence of Runa meaning a written character in the Upper German language area. Five of the nine examples mentioned unambiguously denote runic characters. Um, the runestab example from the Benedictina Fagel could also refer to Latin characters. 
The stop for Runa example already represents, represents a generalization. Runa can be used for characters in other scripts. The two Klopf Runa document examples go even further, proving an extension even to the non-written domain. So this means Runa, as a standalone term or inner compound, is used in the oldest form of German to refer to a wide variety of sign systems, runes, Latin letters, dots, or even noises, and is no longer limited to the meaning of runic sign. We hope that the investigation has been able to show how the connotations of the pagan terms for old Germanic runes, scratched, uh, old Germanic rune scratches in the German-speaking area, in its oldest tangible evidence, were suppressed or changed in their use. Additionally, we hope to have shown how the indigenous technical term for general writing, namely Ritan, was completely replaced by the loan word Skriban in Old High German. So in its surviving monuments, Old High German shows the world that was completely shaped by the cultural technology established by antiquity and the new religion, in which just a few peripheral documents give us the briefest glimpse about the worlds that came before them. Thank you very much. That's brilliant. Many thanks, and also for, I, I know they practice it several times to hone it to exactly um, enough time to give us seven minutes for discussion. So uh, I'll just stop the um, recording to...